This is the last lecture for test number one. And we're talking about early Christian arts of Nubia and Ethiopia. So like I did with Islam, I'll give you kind of the short story of Christianity. Uh, and it may be different than the way that Christianity is considered by some Christians today, uh, but it will help us understand the art that we're gonna look at. Um, so let's continue with the short story. Jesus Christ was crucified in about 33 AD in Jerusalem under the reign of the Roman emperor Tiberius. Uh, so this is the quintessential event in Christianity for the Christian cultures we're gonna look at. In the Old Testament, Adam and Eve committed the original sin. And with this original sin, um, they basically damned humanity. Uh, so just to give you um, the short story, if you're not familiar, <clears throat> in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Old Testament in the Bible, um, Adam and Eve were the primordial human beings, and God put them in this Garden of Eden uh, that was perfect. Uh, they didn't have to worry about feeding themselves or clothing themselves, uh, and they, most importantly, would never die. And when God put them in there, he just told them to not do one thing, and that's eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, so it's kind of interesting in the uh, Old Testament, Eve gets a lot of blame for what's about to happen, but when the story is in the Quran, um, you get equal blame from Adam and Eve. Uh, so anyway, um, a talking serpent um, comes up to Eve and says, well, you know, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because then he knows that you will be like him. Um, if you do eat from this, then, you know, you'll be able to rise up and be like God. So she's convinced. She eats it. She convinces Adam, and he eats it as well. And once they do, they all of a sudden realize they were naked, and they try to hide from God, which they can't do. Uh, and he eventually finds them and bans them from the Garden of Eden. He curses Adam and all future men to have to work in the fields and break their back to make food for their family. And he curses women, Eve and all the women that follow her, with the pain of childbirth. And most importantly, they can now die. Um, so Christians believe that this is a stain of what's called original sin. Um, and this stain prevents people from having salvation. Uh, so in other words, they believe that when people died before Christ, uh, they couldn't go to heaven. They would be stuck in limbo and they would never be able to be with God. And for Christians, that would be uh, kind of horrific. So Christians believe that God made himself into a human. Uh, and then that human sacrificed himself for the salvation of all who have faith in him. Um, so they believe that uh, Christ is one of the persons of God uh, and that his crucifixion um, wiped away this original sin through that sacrifice and allowed people to have salvation um, for all people that believe in him. So uh, during this time period in Palestine, um, Ancient Christians uh, refused to worship the Roman emperor as a god. Um, therefore, Christianity was an underground movement for most of the first three centuries. Uh, the Roman Empire was generally tolerant of religions that were pre-existing um, because they didn't see those as potentially revolutionary, whereas Christianity, since it was a new religion uh, and they saw some associations with anti-authoritarianism and zealots of the time, which is basically people who were leading uprisings against the Romans. Um, they persecuted them for that reason, because they saw it as a potentially uh, revolutionary movement. So with Constantine and Christianity, uh, there's kind of a legendary story, but there's also history that we have. Um, that's documented. So I'll give you both because it's important to understand to understand the art. So according to a Christian bishop, uh, Eusebius, 
before a major battle, uh, Constantine, the Roman emperor in the fourth century, had a vision. He saw a cross that said, in this sign you will conquer. And the sign is here, the Cairo. Uh, the vision told him to put the first two letters of Christ's name on the shields of his soldier, soldiers. And then, according to the legend, Constantine won the battle. So we don't really know if Constantine ever converted to Christianity. Uh, and he continued to follow the Roman religion and, and fulfill his role as the god emperor uh, throughout his life. But um, historically, he issued the Edict of Milan. Uh, and what that did is it extended tolerance to all religions, including Christianity. Uh, so this enabled, um, for the time being, for Christian, Christians to come up from the underground. In some ways, I mean that literally. The, the work that was done of the first three centuries was done in underground catacombs uh, and eventually led to uh, some of the state sponsorship and elite sponsorship of Christianity, like we're going to see uh, in Sudan and Ethiopia. So we don't really know the true origin of Constantine's interest in Christianity. He had an aunt who had converted to Christianity, so it's possible that he believed. Uh, but we don't really know, and it's not really that important uh, for the purposes of understanding the art in this class. So one thing that is important politically, though, because it, again, affects the art, uh, Constantine split the empire in two, founding a new capital at Byzantium in the east. Uh, so he founded a city. Uh, and it was named after him, of course, Constantinople. Um, that is modern-day Istanbul. So in the 5th century, the Western Empire was conquered by various German groups. The Eastern Empire, including Egypt, survived. Uh, so Constantine's idea was to split the empire in two, uh, one half here and then the other half here. Uh, and by doing that, um, he was hoping to make it easier to administer. Uh, and it may have worked that way if everyone was like Constantine, but the emperors that followed uh, weren't quite as um, conscientious, I guess, <laughs> in maintaining the empire. Uh, so eventually these Germanic tribes uh, rolled into the Western Empire and took it over. Uh, they were real bold about it. They went into Rome and lived in the, um, in the villas of the Roman emperors and other elites. Uh, so some of the words for these tribes, just as a side note, um, some of them uh, ended up in modern countries like the Franks, uh, the Angles, um, and then some of them ended up being words that have negative connotations uh, like Goths and Vandals. Um, so it kind of shows that these Germanic tribes were considered to be destructive. Um, but what happened is you know, in most classes, you learn that the Roman Empire falls in the 5th century. Uh, but really, only part of it fell. Uh, the Eastern Empire continued uh, and eventually became a Christian empire. And the styles that were developed in this area um, had a big influence on the styles of art that we're going to see in Africa, uh, like in Ethiopia and Sudan. So the early Christian arts of Nubia and Ethiopia, the first place we'll look at is Faras. Uh, and this picture is the literal painting from Faras, but the building that it was in, the cathedral, uh, no longer exists. I talk about this sometimes when I talk about Egypt, uh, but in the 1960s, Egypt wanted to control the flooding of the Nile, uh, so they built a dam, um, and the dam had a reservoir, which they eventually named Lake Nasser after the president of Egypt. And uh, the reservoir was going to flood uh, a lot of ancient Egyptian works and also this cathedral. Um, so the ancient Egyptian works were taken apart to uh, grand projects that are almost impossible to believe and taken to higher ground. Uh, and at first, um, nobody even knew that these cathedrals existed. Uh, so um, some Polish uh, archaeologists uh, had gotten together um, and worked to um, take apart um, the wall paintings that were in this cathedral uh, and document what was there. Uh, and they brought everything um, to Warsaw. Uh, a couple of, a few years ago, uh, they kind of rebuilt the space of the cathedral and then installed these paintings, uh, which are Juan Fresco paintings. I mean, they're, they're painting that's 
uh, into wet plaster. So you can kind of move the whole things as if they're pieces of a wall and move them into this reproduction at the cathedral. So you can visit the museum in Warsaw and see this nowadays. Um, so Judaism was in Ethiopia since antiquity. Uh, and they're just modern Jewish Ethiopians, some of whom have gone to Israel and unsurprisingly um, faced a lot of racism. Um, and Christianity was widespread by the fourth century. Uh, it, Ethiopia may have been the first um, state that embraced Christianity. So it was in Sudan a little bit later, uh, and eventually there were four Christian kingdoms. You can see the date, it's from AD 1030, um, and it's the Kingdom of Makuria. Uh, the Aswan Dam digs at the Cathedral at Faras. Um, the Aswan Dam is, is the one that was eventually gonna flood the cathedral, uh, and they moved it all to Warsaw. It's stylistically similar to Byzantium. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Normally when I do this in class, I would say, what's similar in these two paintings and what's different? Uh, so you might want to pause it and make a list, uh, and that way it'll be kind of easy to recognize these types of pictures um, on the test and in the future. Um, so take a pause and kind of look at some of the similarities and differences. Um, the similarities that people mostly pick out is the flatness of the picture, uh, the elongated figures, um, the proportions that are very elongated, like these small heads and extremely long bodies. Uh, and the kind of like coldness or just lack of emotion in the faces. Uh, so this is, um, when you add up all of these effects, uh, they tend to be described as transcendent, meaning instead of having um, Christian imagery that's on the earth, literally down the earth, instead they have imagery that brings you up towards heaven. Um, so this is, the big change for Byzantine art. You can see this from the sixth century, but the style basically continued um, even up to the 15th century uh, in the Eastern Empire in Byzantium. Uh, so this one is a little closer in time. Uh, it's after the one from Faras uh, and it's of St. Francis. You can see these same sorts of elongations uh, Francis, like, it doesn't look as if feet are on the ground, particularly. It's like he's floating slightly above it. Uh, lots of flatness going on as well. We don't really have much in the way of background or foreground. The big difference is, you may notice, um, we have kind of a similar skin tone going on here, uh, but we're not sure exactly what the deal is with the skin tones for Mary. Um, the pallid greenish complexion of Mary and the rich brown tones of Marianos may reflect local conventions for showing gender or ethnicity. Uh, so Pizona is um, not exactly going out on a limb here, but it's hard to know exactly what they were thinking with the skin tones. Uh, but this would make sense considering that it had been done in the area before we had seen the same sort of conventions in Egypt. Uh, so I'm going to post a video in the description for these videos. Uh, and it's going to seem like a strange video. It's going to be uh, an Olympic race from 2012. Um, however, I think it'll show you um, some ideas about how Christianity and figures of Mary still exist um, in Sudan and Ethiopia today. So Lale Bala um, is this amazing set of rock cut cathedrals uh, in the highlands in Ethiopia. Uh, so sometimes when people are exposed to Ethiopia in the West, they think of the lowlands where not a lot of people live, uh, that are very hot and dry, um, and that suffered um, great famines in the 80s and then periodically after that. Although um, I should say the famines weren't, weren't, weren't accidental. Um, <clears throat> But this is the Ethiopian highlands, uh, and there are a lot of people that live there. Uh, some of these places are seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 feet up. Uh, and these parts of Ethiopia are temperate um, and very green. Uh, so it may not be the vision of Ethiopia that you have in your head. So Christianity in Egypt and Ethiopia goes back almost to the time of Christ himself. Uh, and in the New Testament of the Bible, there's a lot of indications of this. 
So the conversion of the Emperor Azana in AD 324 uh, is possibly the first Christian state um, in Ethiopia. So eventually they had the Zagwe dynasty, which was 900 to 1270. Uh, and of that dynasty, Geber Maskel Lalibela. Uh, and this is a very popular name, by the way, um, all three names in Ethiopia today. He's revered as a saint. Uh, and his idea was he looked at Jerusalem and um, the cathedrals that they had there, uh, and he wanted to reproduce them in the Ethiopian highlands, but out of the living rock. So in other words, this is this was just solid granite before um, this project started. So if you're thinking this would take a while and it's kind of amazing, uh, I would agree with you. So there was 11 of these uh, rock cut churches matching the ones in Jerusalem and even tried to kind of map out the Ethiopian highlands and match the places as the ones that were in Jerusalem. This idea of making a new Jerusalem is very common in Christianity. Christianity is evangelical uh, and many Christian sects had plotted the idea of creating new Jerusalems. Um, a lot of the um, kind of somewhat radical Christians that came to uh, that colonized the United States also had some of the same ideas. Um, so you can see how it's dug down into the rock. Uh, and there's actually a path that you can take to get downwards. Uh, and it's still used today, um, mostly for um, special events. Uh, it's not necessarily used as an everyday church. Um, but all of this is rock cut, so it's all carved on the inside as well. So when you go down into it, you can see, again, it's amazing that this is all um, cut out of the living rock. So this project was amazing to the people at the time as well. So some legends grew up around it, um, like Vasona shares one that says, the angels took up the tools of the sleeping workers so they could complete this project uh, in time um, in Lalibala's life. So the central plan is very similar to the Byzantine churches. So just like the two-dimensional art is in Byzantine style, uh, the three-dimensional art is similar as well. This is San Vitale uh, from Ravenna. And this kind of like um, centrally planned church instead of the long basilica-like church that's popular in the Western Empire uh, is the um, Byzantine style. And it also had a pretty big influence on Islamic art as well, especially mosques. So the Solomonic period is the dynasty that actually existed until the 20th century. Uh, the Zagwe dynasty falls in 1270, and Manilek I, um, who claims descent from Queen Sheba and Solomon, um, founds the dynasty. Uh, so the Solomonic leaders all the way up into the 20th century considered themselves to be descendants of Sheba and Solomon. If you're not familiar with that story, Solomon uh, was one of the kings of um, the ancient Hebrews, and um, he supposedly uh, had a relationship with Queen Sheba, uh, and they had a child. So uh, many people, by the way, claim... Um, an origin of Queen Sheba, the people of Yemen today in the Arabian Peninsula also claim descent um, from Queen Sheba and Solomon. So uh, a lot of the art that's being made is for the royal family uh, and being made in monasteries. So these illuminated manuscripts, uh, like this one, um, was one of those. They're painted with tempera. And if you're not familiar with tempera, uh, it is a painting medium that is really good if you want to have uh, very thin layers of paint and great precision. Uh, so a lot of these books are relatively small. <laughs> you know, if you're seeing it on a big screen, it's, it's much bigger on the, on the screen than it would be in reality. Uh, but temper is the perfect um, medium for that sort of thing. Um, it's written in gaddle. Uh, I mean, the gaddle, the, temp the uh, manuscripts are written in gaze. Um, and this is a liturgical language nowadays. So it's kind of like the way that um, Latin used to func function in the Catholic Church. The language was preserved as this literary spiritual language. Um, but there has been a big movement in Ethiopia to teach people how to read it 
because a lot of poetry and scholarship is written in Giz. And um, to understand the language, it's easier to understand it in the original language, or you can get the full understanding of it in the original language rather than in translations. Uh, so what you see in these are uh, harag vegetation-like forms here, and very similar to what you would see in Byzantine art uh, and also in um, Hibernian Saxon art in Western Europe. So again, kind of seeing similar things to what you would see in Hiberno Saxon art with these interlace patterns uh, and also the way that the birds here look like they're made out of metal. Uh, so a lot of influences um, and influencing going on with these pieces. Uh, so this shows the canon table. Um, Ethiopians still today, there was called Orthodox Christianity. It's also Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. And that just refers to the separation in the Catholic Church and um, about a thousand years ago uh, into an Eastern Church and a Western Church. Uh, so the Eastern Church has a few extra books compared to the Western Church. So this style eventually developed into what became kind of an iconic Ethiopian style. Uh, and you can still see it being used today. Um, so King Zara Jacob. Uh, that just means Jacob in the 15th century, encourages worship of Miriam. Uh, so Miriam is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, and this same sort of thing was happening in Italy as well. Uh, and some Christians uh, didn't like this. They thought that it made Mary into a mother goddess. Uh, and I think it did actually in some ways make Mary into a mother goddess. Uh, but this was very appealing to many people. Um, to kind of have not just Jesus, this masculine figure, but also like a feminine figure. So Visonis is something, and I don't know if I agree with it so much, and I'll explain why. So as in many African depictions of motherhood, faces show little expression, but gestures are full of meaning. So you can see that here, we have kind of like blank faces, and we do have a gesture that seems to have lots of meaning. When we see their faces, there isn't much going on. Uh, but the expression is really sweet. It's like uh, Jesus the baby is kind of like turning his mother's head um, and she's holding this little thing, um, this little sprig to him. Uh, you can see a real like human kind of emotional reaction going on here. But it's similar to what was being done in Italy. According to Haldeman, it was influenced by 14th century Byzantine style Italian art. Uh, so you can see that with the Maya style from Duccio. Um, we have these like kind of uh, arrangement of figures that are all in the foreground. Again, we don't have much in the way of background like we saw in the earlier Byzantine art, but there are differences. So it'd be a good idea to stop the video and try to make a list of the differences that are going on and new things that are happening here compared to what's being done in Italy. Um, so you can do that. Uh, I'm not actually gonna say uh, what students usually say, because I, I think all of you can come up with that. So kind of look at this and see what you can see. Um, and once you make a list of these differences, I think you'll understand what's going on with Ethiopian art and why this style was so influential. So Freseon um, is an individual, but a lot of his work, uh, we're not sure if it was done by him. Uh, so sometimes you'll see like the di Detroit Institute of Art, they have a piece that says from the school of Frey Seon, um, the style he developed was just so influential that people basically copied it and kept doing it uh, even to this day. Uh, so here's another example of the kind of like blank faces, uh, but the tender emotions with the way that they're, um, they're using their hand gestures. So perhaps not um, necessarily something that has to do with the same sort of things we'll see in West Africa. So um, with this stuff, it's just talking about how there are um, Mary's sprig of flowers, her flower is a symbol of virgin birth. It just talks about how like when Christians move from one place to another, you can't keep the same iconography. Uh, so Mary um, is often symbolized by a lily, but in Ethiopia where lilies don't grow, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so they change the icons so that they make sense to the people. 
Uh, so Miriam icons continue to be popular in Ethiopia today. And again, I'll post um, a video uh, and it will be the end of this race from the Olympics in 2012. And you'll see what Mesret Tafar does after she wins the race. If you're not aware, by the way, um, people from Ethiopia and Kenya completely dominate um, mid and long distance events uh, on the international stage. Um, so these types of uh, sports are really important in both of the areas we've been looking at. So later Christian art in Ethiopia, uh, in the 16th century, they were overrun by the Ottoman Empire, which became a grand em empire taking over most of the Eastern um, Roman Empire and then moving even east of that. So the royal family moved south and they continued this style that was established uh, by Frey Seyon uh, in the decoration in churches. So this is a church of Debri Berhan Selassie. Selassie, again, a very popular name in Ethiopia. And they call this style the Gondarine style, but really it's just developing from what Frey Seyon established. Um, this one is called the Church of the Trinity. Uh, and we have a picture of the Trinity right here, but it's done in quite a different way than you would see Europeans doing it. Uh, so if we compare uh, to the way that Europeans did it, this is Masaccio's Trinity. Um, Christians believe, and I kind of implied this earlier, that there's one God and three persons. Uh, they don't consider that to be multiple gods. They just say it's three persons. Uh, so one of the persons is God the Father, and Masaccio is picturing him here. Uh, and then there's a God made flesh, Jesus, God made into a human. And then it's hard to see in this picture, but there's a dove, and that represents the Holy Spirit. And that's God's presence um, all around people. Um, but that kind of icon wouldn't really make sense to Ethiopians. Uh, so instead, they use the concept of three elders. And in a way, um, this more precisely explains the idea of one God and three persons uh, than this one, where you kind of think, hey, are there multiple gods here? Uh, whereas um, in the Ethiopian imagery, where they're all the same, uh, it shows that it is one God, three persons, a little bit more precisely. Uh, we can see some of the other things that are going on here that are explaining that short story of Christianity, just like Masaccio is here. Uh, so at the bottom of Masaccio's, we have a skeleton. It says, uh, what I am, you will be. Um, and it's referring to humans die. Uh, and this refers to Adam. So when the first sin happened, it enabled humans to die. We have the same thing over here, portrayed in a slightly different way. We have Adam. Then we have the crucifixion. Uh, and that's the thing that wiped away this original sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, and through that, you can kind of show this short story of Christianity. Um, the first sin, humans are doomed, and then uh, God made flesh, and he sacrifices that flesh and um, enables everyone to have salvation. So both pictures also have Mary uh, and then John, the one masculine disciple of Jesus that didn't leave him. And then this one tells some additional parts of the story. Uh, there's the thieves that are behind him, um, one of who is saved by having a conversation with Jesus. Uh, you can see the Mary and John figures right here. Uh, and then another one where it's a Roman soldier who pokes into the body of Christ with a, um, with a spear and then eventually heals somebody when his blood comes in and water, they say, comes into his eye. The last thing, and it's here uh, that you can kind of see in the Masaccio at the bottom, uh, this thing that looks like a mask represents a skull. That's from the gospel stories where they say that Jesus was buried in a place called uh, Golgotha, which was, uh, they said, translates to skull place. Uh, so in other words, a, a place of executions. When you look at the ceiling, you can see um, this Freseon style coming up. Uh, it's very linear, it's saturated, um, it's um, kind of stylized instead of trying to be naturalistic. So you can see how it's both a development of what was done in Byzantine art uh, and also a very unique Ethiopian style. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, hmm, that's those angels on the ceiling, they look kind of familiar. I think I might have seen something like that before. 
you may have if you've been in Ferndale or in Ann Arbor and seen the Blue Nile restaurant. Uh, so Blue Nile uh, restaurants, there's one in Ann Arbor and one in Ferndale. Uh, and Blue Nile is kind of a generic name. It just means Ethiopian restaurant. Um, I highly recommend them, by the way. Uh, and if you're over 21, definitely get some Ethiopian beer. Uh, but you can see how the food is served, uh, where you have this soft kind of spongy bread, and then people dip into these various like spicy meats or spicy vegetables. Uh, and then you have this like salad like stuff afterwards, a nice spicy beer if you're 21. Um, so I highly recommend this and you can see a lot of other, uh, these baskets uh, and these designs up here uh, that are all developments of that Freseon style um, and still being used today. So this is a good place to transition to contemporary Ethiopia. Uh, and the first artist we're gonna look at is working in that style in some ways that developed from Frey Seyan, and that's Garamawi Mazgabu. Uh, and he's one of the many types of artists that are Deb Terra, which are lay priests. If you're not familiar with this term, this means um, <clears throat> priests that aren't ordained uh, and they don't have to remain celibate which is probably a good thing, uh, and assist in churches. Um, so Vasona talks about these types of pieces that they once functioned as talismans, not the best word to use, Vasona, sacred schools providing mystical protection for his clients. Um, so these were originally used uh, for ceremonial purposes. Uh, so they were painted upon the skin of a goat that was sacrificed to God to invoke blessing and forgiveness. Uh, so this is kind of like an ancient tradition that goes back um, to the Old Testament of the Bible, the idea of sacrifice um, to win favor with God or to be able to get something. Um, this particular piece uh, is based on the Kambala and um, these types of mandalas, which are sometimes called, um, are based on that idea. If you're not familiar with the K Kabbalah, it's a type of Jewish mysticism um, the kind of fundamental belief in it is that uh, there are a, there's a true message to the ancient Hebrew skip scriptures and that it can be read um, by reading um, into the text. Um, ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew as well, um, all of the characters can be placed into numbers. Uh, and it's believed that if you can interpret these numbers, you can get kind of the mystical meaning uh, behind the text of the scriptures. Um, so the practices that go along with this are using these patterns that are mathematical, the Kabbalah, um, to get kind of closer to this mathematical spirituality, I guess you could say. Um, but the paintings that we're looking at are ones that are made for foreign collectors. Um, so originally they would make these things and, um, you know, he would have the skills to be able to uh, make them for the ceremonies. Uh, but foreign collectors started seeing these and said, you know, I want to buy this. Uh, and he started to sell them to him. So it's important to make a differentiation between uh, what Mazgabu is doing, uh, you know, trying to, to make a living out of his work and what outside collectors may be doing. Um, and Vasona actually has pretty good comments about that. Um, so for Mazgabu, it's no longer intended to bless and heal, but rather intrigue and decorate. Um, these patterns just are, are beautiful uh, to most people, even if they don't understand the meanings. So um, as far as collectors, they may be looking at these sorts of things and thinking of its exotic otherness. Uh, so really coming from uh, a kind of like a soft imperialist view uh, as far as what these paintings are done. And if you think that's a, too extreme of me to say, I can tell you that um, finding anything that Mazgabu has to say about this work uh, has been pretty much impossible. And that's what you'll find with a lot of artists that are making um, traditional or ceremonial works and then making um, different versions of them for foreign collectors nobody seems to care what the artists themselves are saying about the work. Um, and again, that comes from this idea that they are just 
interested in the exotic otherness and not in the actual content of the work. So we'll talk about in this section um, four different contemporary artists. Uh, so the first one we're going to talk about in this section, 20th century artist from Cairo, is Hassan Fathi. And out of all of them, until recently, I'd say he's one of the most famous. Uh, but a couple of artists we'll talk about later on, I think, are maybe even more famous than Hassan Fathi. Uh, he's an architect. And he was influenced by the houses of Nubia, um, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. And he believed that um, Egypt, as part of um, decolonizing, um, would be to return to mud-brick mud brick architecture suited to Egypt. Uh, so to give you a little background, a lot of places that were colonized by the British, um, there comes to be an association with uh, things that are British and power. So even after independence, even after fighting a revolution, uh, sometimes that association can still exist. Uh, so um, this is certainly the case in India, uh, where many elites are fond of playing squash and dressing, uh, going to British schools and dressing in you know, Brooks Brothers and other um, bespoke British clothing. Uh, there's this association with being elite in the formal imperial power. Um, and in the case of Egypt, uh, and architecture, uh, that's a pretty big problem because the architecture that the British Empire built in Egypt uh, is, would be great if it was in England, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's in a very dry and relatively hot place that gets cool at night, like Egypt. Um, but Egyptians for, and people in Sudan as well, uh, for thousands of years had their own style of architecture that work best for the environment of Egypt. Um, mud brick architecture, sometimes called adobe for, you know, Southwest uh, Native Americans make it, but it's the same material and it comes up in every culture that lives in these types of places. Uh, mud brick stays cool uh, relatively in the summer uh, and then it's a good insulator too. So in cool nights that you have in many desert areas, um, it can keep it warm. Um, the other thing, and this, this has kind of come to a very clear head in recent times, uh, during the Arab Spring uh, and the uprisings and revolution that happened in Egypt uh, starting in 2011, um, one of the reasons why is because uh, the government run by um, the U.S.-supported President Osni Mubarak of Egypt um, wasn't able to keep electricity um, going to all of the residents. Um, and part of the reason why is because people were living in these um, European style houses, houses and were paying a lot for air conditioning. Um, so even before that time, people like Fathi had recognized on the necessity of it. But because again of that association with uh, power and Britishness, uh, it was a hard sell to people. Um, so uh, again, many people are interested in decolonization movements. Uh, part of the education that goes into decolonization is letting people know how um, they've kind of eternalized um, the imperial uh, uh, people that have occupied their land. Um, so he was really about not just with the architecture um, kind of embracing what work, works best and modernizing what works best for Egypt. Uh, but he also looked back at Egyptian culture and he looks at things like uh, ancient Egyptian papyrus and he uses some of the um, formal types of um, arrangements that we would see uh, and then mixes them with the pretty standard way of doing um, architectural drawings uh, and it works really well. Remember we talked about uh, composite view, where you can see things from above and from the side in the same frame. That's normally what modern architects do in their drawings, uh, and it's integrated perfectly here into an Egyptian style of that. We can see some of these figures from the side, this building, and then we see other ones from the top. So he's influenced by a bunch of things, uh, but one of them are these painted houses in Nubia. Uh, and this photograph is from the 60s because this particular area and almost all of these houses uh, were flooded by Lake Nasser. Uh, so they're no longer there. Uh, and these houses are interesting. I purposely picked a house with 
um, a woman walking in front uh, because they are decorated by women with these designs uh, and kind of like pictographs that um, had a certain amount of power uh, and they could also be passed uh, through families. Uh, so this white stucco and these designs are believed to be not just interesting, uh, but also to have some spiritual power to them. So you can kind of see their relationship with the hieroglyphics uh, in ancient Egypt continuing in this today. So he built the mosque at New Gurner in Luxor in Egypt. Um, and you can kind of imagine how people might have embraced it at first. When you look at this, it looks like mud brick. Uh, it is modern. It is at the same time using very ancient techniques. Uh, but people at first, again, they're used to uh, the types of architecture that they would see from Europeans and also were used to um, things that look like this, uh, where it almost looks unfinished. Uh, it doesn't seem to be um, something that would be good enough for a mosque. Uh, so at first, when people saw it, uh, they didn't embrace it. Um, but he's using some things that are very interesting. The Nubian vault, which is thousands of years old, and it's a way of making um, these types of domes. Um, and it's also very useful. Again, it fits in the weather. So it was never fully accepted by villagers, um, but that has changed a lot since, um, since the revolution, uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood took over, they also had trouble keeping the lights on. Uh, so um, a lot more Egyptians are embracing this type of architecture when they realize uh, that it fits Egypt a lot better, uh, and it's also a way to protect themselves um, from imperialism, especially from the United States. So this artist, Gazbia Suri, um, is an Egyptian artist, and she's really well known in Egypt today um, and kind of celebrated in Egypt. And she went through many different styles. Uh, the style that we're looking at right here, Untitled, most of her works are Untitled, uh, has a very modernist style. So the first thing I would do uh, is pause the video and kind of look at it and see, does it remind you of um, modernism? So when I'm talking about modernism, I'm talking about the art that developed in the early 20th century uh, in Europe, especially by people like Picasso and Matisse. Uh, so think of the artist um, from those time periods and see if you can see anything uh, that is like those artists you know, write them down, you can put them on the extra credit board or something like that. Um, so she was part of a group of modern art. Uh, it was part of an art education um, before Egypt was independent. <clears throat> but um, I think when you see the modernist work, so the European type ideas in here, also it's a good idea to look at what's Egyptian about this though. Uh, what can you see in here, like we saw in Hassan Fathi, relates to more recent things in Egypt or more ancient things in Egypt. So you could also pause the video and make a list of that, put in an extra credit board. Uh, so the other thing that we see developing, and we're gonna see it throughout the contemporary artists all throughout Africa, uh, direct po political consciousness with nationalist fervor and had earlier on identified with the folk art traditions and pharaonic art. Uh, so this is from an article about, uh, written by Akeke Ogulu, um, who is a Nigerian art historian I um, highly recommend, look up if you want to learn uh, a lot about African art and also see it from a perspective of someone that's actually African. So this article, Akeki Agulu is talking about Gazbi Asuri and the next artist that we're going to talk about uh, after this. So I'll bring her in in a moment. So um, as far as uh, nationalistic fervor, um, the things that are kind of helpful to talk about in this is to look at the art uh, and kind of see how that tells the story of some of the things that were going on in Egypt. Um, so when Egypt became independent, um, it was part of a socialist or social democratic. Uh, so socialist would, is one thing, but then social democratic would be more like um, Bernie Sanders. Uh, and that's kind of like what Nasser, Nasser was. He was that type of leader at first. Um, during the revolution, he promised that um, he would take all the resources of Egypt instead of them streaming out of Egypt, he would use them to build schools, uh, to build infrastructure. Um, and 
this is a very common thing that happened in Africa. Almost all the places we're going to look at happen. Um, but uh, imperialists hate that <laughs> because they don't want the resources to be going back. They want the resources to be coming out. Um, so many former imperialist countries, Britain, one of them, and certainly the United States, tried to use their influence uh, to stop social democracy or socialism happening in African countries. And that's precisely what happened um, in Egypt under Nasser. So he started out with a lot of promise and people really believed in him. Uh, but as he became rightfully paranoid of um, foreign interference, he became more authoritarian and started to persecute his enemies. Uh, so compared to a later portrait of the artist's husband, a portrait of Adele, the facial features of the figure and the martyr seem to suggest that this victim might in fact be Adele, who was incarcerated by Nasser government for 33 months in the early 1960s. Uh, so if you look at this picture, it's called Martyr. Um, it'd be a good idea to kind of like try to figure out what is the message in this picture. Uh, and I think people will see multiple messages or even contradictory messages. And um, some people will see uh, po more positive things and others will see more negative things. Uh, what we often see in Suri's work is this kind of like contrast between two opposites. Uh, and it's not always exactly clear which um, side of the opposite um, that she's putting us on. So just to give an example, you could stop it and kind of look at it and try to try to figure out what's going on. Just to give you an example, some people consider um, the figure, the martyr figure, to be reaching up on the branch and pulling himself out. Others feel like he's being drawn downwards and the branch is the only thing that's stopping him from that happening. Uh, so you can look at the other parts of the picture and try to figure it out because Gatsby Astori doesn't want to give us anything in the face to indicate uh, what side she's on. She likes to kind of show these contrasts. So when her work becomes more um, abstract and even non-objective in some ways, uh, you can read these types of contrasts. So this one takes a, a little bit of background, uh, so I have to do that. Um, so what happened in the late 60s uh, was this, these things I'm going to talk about are actually some of the most important things that you can understand uh, to know what's going on in the world today, uh, especially regarding U.S. imperialism and the Middle East. Uh, so what happened at this time is um, the country of Israel, which was founded in 1947, uh, and which immediately um, was seen by uh, many Palestinians as a colonist project, um, and in some ways it was, in some ways it wasn't. Um, when Israel was first founded, they didn't get any support from the United States, uh, just a little bit of support, um, but generally the United States stayed out of it. Uh, and they remained that way um, through the 60s. But um, as Israel became more um, kind of protective and build up a more and more sophisticated military, um, they eventually uh, became quite a military power in the Middle East. Uh, and in the 60s, they got into a war with Egypt and some other Arab countries. Uh, and in the case of Egypt, um, it was what's called the Six Day War, which happened in 1967. Uh, and this war was a total and complete defeat of the Egyptians by um, Israel through air power. Uh, they didn't really have it much in the way of land operations. They came in and they bombed Egyptian cities and it was over very, very quickly. Um, so I'll kind of explain what happened after this because it's important to understand when we look at how things progress and also just generally if you understand uh, some of the things that happened in Egypt. Uh, so after this war, um, the United States saw Israel um, and realized that they should be supporting them uh, because they could be a good vehicle for projecting U.S. power um, in the Middle East, and they remain that way today. So after this war, beginning in the 70s, um, the U.S. gave most of their foreign aid, and, and when the U.S. says foreign aid, mostly what they're talking about uh, is military um, aid, so giving people weapons. Israel became the top target for foreign aid uh, of the United States, and then 
The second top target was Egypt, and it remained that way um, until uh, until the Iraq War in 2004. Uh, and then Iraq became the biggest um, receiver of U.S. aid, and I put quotes up because really that means military um, aid. So um, you're probably like, wait, why are they? Why would the U.S. Uh, support both sides? Uh, and that's pretty common. That's what they want to do. They want to be able to exert influence, uh, and they need to be able to do that um, through people that would normally consider to be enemies. Um, there was a, a sort of uneasy peace broker between the United States, Israel, and Egypt uh, in the 70s, um, but it didn't really last. Um, so uh, the promise of Nasser of social democracy and kind of like giving, um, you know, all of the resources to Egypt back to its people uh, became more and more lost um, as they had a succession of leaders that were kinder and kinder in the United States, uh, ending with Osni Mubarak, who took power through U.S. support in the 1980s, and he remained in power until 2011 when the uprising brought him down. Um, so all of this, like, isn't quite known by Surrey at this point, uh, but you can see hints of it. Uh, there. So the crushing defeat resulted in a loss of faith and in questioning by many Egyptians of the entire nationalist and pan Arabist project on which Nasser's popularity had stood. So when we're talking about pan Arabism or um, Arab nationalism, uh, we're talking about an anti colonial uh, type of nationalism, meaning we're going to fight against uh, imperialists and, you know, our identity as being victims of imperialism is more important. Uh, than any, you know, conflicts that we may have. So what we're seeing in this one, again, is like something that you might want to read into, like pause the video and try to see what you're seeing here. Um, the first thing that, that students usually notice is this contrast. We have this green color and then this brown color. Uh, and then they see something like these organized buildings. They're in red. Everything seems to be pretty good. Uh, and then we see this like kind of brown and black, uh, buildings where everything is kind of disorganized, but it also looks almost like figures. Uh, we see feet and maybe eyes here. Uh, so many people read this as like kind of a before and after, uh, before the destruction and after the destruction. And then some people read it as also um, another way would be, you know, we have these European style buildings that are all stacked on top of each other. And then we have things more that are like, um, represent like the way that Egypt looks like with the mud brick and things like that. So there's many different ways to read it and this type of contrast where we kind of see the opposite streaming into each other is something that she does again. This is called metamorphosis. Um, so again, you could read that as um, destruction or you could possibly read it as um, decolonizing. Um, perhaps both work. Uh, so with this one, I often ask the class, it's again metamorphosis, what they're seeing. Uh, so you may want to look at that. Oftentimes people will see multiple images. Sometimes they'll see figures, they'll see things like hieroglyphs. Uh, they'll again see these contrasts between um, different sections of the painting. Um, they'll see things that are like um, negative or some things that are positive. Some people see a smile here. Other people see uh, other types of uh, kind of scary stuff because of the disorganization here. Uh, other people will see composite view, like we're seeing part of a face from the front and then part of it from the side. All of those interpretations I think are valid and um, Gatsby Asari would be interested in those. So she kept with this style uh, where we see these types of contrasts. Um, she says, uh, Akeke Ogulo says about her, she is primarily motivated, as she has stated, referring to her late return, the enduring theme of metamorphic houses and people by fear and love. Uh, so seeming contrasts, um, but you know, sometimes fear can prevent people uh, from getting to love. So what I think is fascinating, uh, and we're going to see this appear again in the class, is that Surrey has become very popular in the international art market. But if you were to look up her paintings, um, at um, like Sotheby's or one of the other um, big galleries who are selling our paintings, all of the political views, um, all of the like kind of deeper emotional views will be sucked out of it. 
uh, and they won't even mention it. They'll just talk about the formal things. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, sometimes people who are consuming this art, they want something, uh, but they don't want the somethings that might make them uncomfortable. So this one, again, is interpreted in many different ways. Uh, some people see this as um, an Egyptian um, coffin, uh, and I think it's pretty hard not to see that. And then other ones see like some youth, um, perhaps love here. I've had some people who interpreted it as someone waiting at the bedside of a relative who's dying, um, or to show kind of like literally like fear and love and show those contrasts. Uh, so it's hard to know, but all of those are, are probably as valid as any other. So Gata Mir was also mentioned in the same article by Akakye Gulu, um, a different type of artist, but also speaking towards what's happening um, in Egypt, uh, how Egypt is perceived, um, and also talking about gender and identity. Uh, so this is a pretty good artist to pick in, the, in, this, in this case, I think. So Gata Amir was born in 1963 in Egypt. We're getting close to artists that are close to my age. I was born in 73. Uh, and her family left at 11 for Paris. Um, her parents were very, um, wanted to kind of uplift the family uh, and were very, I think they're lawyers <laughs> or doctors. Um, and so they had a typical um, immigrant view towards their kids. They said, we're living, you know, we're strangers in a strange land, uh, and we have to try harder than everybody else to make it. Um, and they tried to instill that in their daughter. Um, but as you might imagine, their daughter had different plans. Uh, so she grew up in France, uh, and she's now in New York. Uh, and I'll include a video you'll be able to see later on where she talks about her own work. Um, she says, I speak about women's pleasure. Women should use this power of seduction, if necessary, without being called frivolous snakes, witches, or prostitutes. I just wanted to take a typically feminine craft, sewing, and make of it a language which, which to compete within a very masculine area of painting. Uh, so in this way, Amir is um, doing a lot of the same things that um, artists around the world are doing um, to try to take these mediums that are thought to be feminine uh, and therefore not artistic um, and say, no, this is fine art uh, and these types of things uh, deserve to, to have a place with all the, the other art styles. Um, it's also towards an art with meaning uh, and not just a formal art, uh, which was also thought to be kind of like a masculine thing, making art without meaning. So uh, according to Arneson, uh, Amir transforms images taken from pornographic magazines and a form of feminism through a commitment to craft. Uh, so kind of just reiterating um, what Amir is saying about her own work. She had struggled to become an art artist. Uh, and part of the reason why is because it's a struggle for anyone to become an artist. Um, uh, those of you that are listening that are planning on becoming artists, uh, you probably already know what I mean. Uh, and it's a struggle to become an artist as a woman. It's a struggle to become an artist as someone who's seen as foreign in, in the land that is your own. Um, but also her parents uh, were not particularly fond of her work. Uh, they were um, rather conservative, but also didn't want to make too many waves. So seeing their daughter, instead of becoming a doctor or a lawyer, becoming an artist was a problem. And then seeing her dealing with uh, pornography uh, was also a problem. Um, but apparently her parents are a little bit better with it now that she's a world famous artist, but still not as good as they might like to be. Uh, so in this one, you can see like a pretty typical type of work that she uses. Uh, she takes um, pornographic imagery that um, from magazines, she started doing this in the 90s uh, before there was internet. Um, and much of this pornographic work is made for the male gaze. Uh, so if you're not familiar with that concept, it's like kind of a general concept as in uh, imagery is generally made as if it's being seen through a heterosexual man's eyes. Uh, and that's the case with the imagery she uses. Um, but to go along with her kind of like um, taking back these types of images, uh, she wants to put power into these images that are made for the display of men. 
uh, and again, you know, not be called frivolous snakes, witches, or prostitutes. So our idea is to take back sensuality for women by women. Uh, so in 1993 is when she first looks at pornography as a source. And she has an interesting view, and I'll kind of explain what's going on and how it relates to what Gosby Osuri went through um, and the other things that we talked about in a moment. So I was in Cairo in the midst of August 1988, and I was downtown with my mother when I saw a magazine called Venus. It attracted my attention because the cover read, Special Edition for Veiled Women, Month of August. The entire 1980s was a big drawback for women's rights in Egypt. Each summer I was there, I witnessed the rising number of veiled women. Women in the street, then my relatives, my aunts, mother, cousins, friends. Every woman I know was choosing to return to a traditional veil. It was very upsetting. Uh, so many people saw the Nasser revolution uh, that happened in the 50s and 60s as continuing um, kind of old Islamic traditions of women um, having power. Uh, but also as kind of like modernizing those traditions and taking away the barriers that women had. Uh, and for some women, that was choosing not to wear the veil. Um, and then uh, with the 80s, uh, with U.S. support of Asni Mubarak, uh, who again was a president from the 1980s uh, until, uh, the, until 2011 when the revolution happened and the U.S. supported him right up until uh, it was clear that he was going to be removed. Um, what goes along with those sorts of uh, leaders is they'll often, and, and Azim Mubarak did this, um, they'll look at reactionary elements, which always rise um, in countries that have been colonized, um, and kind of uh, look to them, and they're often anti-American for obvious reasons, but they're also often very patriarchal, uh, and they look back to this supposed Islamic tradition that existed before where women were in their place. That's not exactly accurate, and that's what God Amira wants to work against in her work. Um, but it did create an environment that made it more difficult for some women. Uh, and after the revolution, it was also the case that that was happening. Um, so that's pretty typical, but at the same time, Mubarak, where he was like, uh, kind of giving, um, you know, stepping back and let, letting those sort of things happen. He was also taking um, billions of dollars uh, in weapons uh, to continue to stay in power uh, from the United States. Uh, and the United States loves it when they have these reactionary movements uh, because it allows them to have an excuse to be able to continue to dominate an area. Uh, so things have become more complex since then. Uh, so to bring it back to Surrey and the other things we were talking about, uh, Gatsby of Surrey, she doesn't wear the veil. Uh, she's a woman that became uh, the most famous painter in Egypt. Uh, so uh, she's an example of kind of what the Nasser revolution was able to do for women. Um, and some people think that some of those things are being taken away. Um, but it's more complex nowadays. So as far as looking at the veil on the other side, um, how this artist was chosen, I first uh, talked about Gatsby of Surrey in my modern art class, and I had the students choose contemporary artists that they wanted me to cover. And um, most of my, this was at Henry Ford College, uh, and most of my students are Muslim, uh, and the person who chose Gatsby of Surrey was a woman who was wearing the veil. Uh, so for some women, the veil is a choice. For others that feel that it isn't, uh, it has a different function. Uh, and Gatsby Asuri is also aware of this. So in these pictures, hopefully you were taking the time while I was talking to try to pick out what was going on. And what's cool about her um, kind of like uh, embroidery paintings is that they have this really um, neat kind of like three-dimensional effect to them uh, where you see at first nothing. You see a lot of abstraction, but then you can see the figures that are inside when you see these in person, some of these threads seem to kind of float above, and then the images in the background of naked women here become more clear. Uh, so when you get in close, you can see the figures. And again, these types of figures are um, ones that are made for pornography. It was directed towards men. So our works are created with the help of Reza Farkanda, who draws the outlines. In the video that I'm going to post for you, she'll explain how, how Reza, he just went 
up to her painting and started doing it in the studio. And she was like, that was bold, but hey, I like that. Uh, so they started working together um, to, because he's, he's actually a little bit more um, solid on embroidery than she is. So uh, he does some of that sort of physical work. Um, so in other words, by populating our canvases with unveiled women, Amir seems to suggest that post-pornography and veiling participate in scopophilia and the sexualization of the female body. So Kake Agulu is saying something very interesting here. Um, it's saying that pornography that's made for the male gaze, uh, where we have you know, a very explicit total nudity, uh, and veiling come from the same place. Scopophilia means that you get off on looking at things, uh, and that's a pretty obvious thing from pornography. Uh, but it also kind of shows that um, both covering up a woman's body or completely exposing it for the male gaze are coming from this place of the woman's body can only exist um, sexually or as an object. Um, and it kind of like speaks against women being able to control themselves. Uh, so if women want to sexualize their bodies, we're not seeing that. Uh, and by veiling them, they're saying women are inherently sexual and you have to control others' reaction to it. Uh, and, you know, it kind of says, oh, but women can't have control over this sort of thing. Um, so that kind of like contrast um, of things that are actually fairly similar is a big theme that you see in her work. Uh, so this one would take some time to figure out. So what I suggest you do is pause it and see what you see at first and then keep looking and see what you see more of. The bigger the screen is, sometimes it's harder to see. So if you see this on a small screen, it might be easier to see. But uh, Amira is fond of like um, humorous little puns, so naughty but nice. So the first thing that most students notice is we have women in the background uh, and if you look closely, uh, they're masturbating. Um, so the way the expressions on their faces um, are what you would see that was typical of pornography. In other words, not necessarily if, an orgasmic face as it would exist in reality, but one that is a performance for the male gaze. Um, and then interestingly, you see something else. If you look here in the colors, you can see it's the seven dwarves. So like a lot of stories, and it's the, the ones from the Disney movie, like a lot of Disney movies, uh, it shows like a very interesting um, kind of view of femininity and how men relate to femininity. So if you don't remember the story, the Disney version, um, Snow White is this woman who has an evil queen who's jealous of her youthful beauty. Uh, and she is, um, she poisons her um, and she falls asleep, but not before she meets this man who for some reason she falls in love with him just based on his looks, even though he hasn't said a thing. Uh, then she wakes up um, and she ends up finding this, uh, the seven dwarves um, in their house. And she does the thing. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. She cleans up their house and then they come home and they're just kind of accepting of her because she did this. Uh, and she's one with the animals. And then the story ends with her getting the kiss from this prince who she doesn't even know and him taking her away from these little guys that she's not interested in. So kind of seeing the viewers of the dwarves looking at these masturbating women, uh, you can kind of see perhaps like a more um, explicit view of how the seven dwarves is considered, uh, how women can be considered servants and that's very pleasing and also how love is nothing but um, being taken by someone. So um, she likes to play with these in a humorous way. Uh, so you can see the face right here. Um, she says that she's culturally but not religiously Muslim. So in other words, she grew up around um, all of the culture and the art uh, which she was influenced by, um, but she herself doesn't follow the religion anymore. Sometimes students uh, will hear this, and if they're Muslim, they'll say that's not possible. Uh, so, um, you know, that's a valid view, um, but Amir thinks it is possible. So speaking along with that, uh, one of the things that Amir wants to work against is this idea that um, Islam and Christianity as well, that they are um, repressive sexually. 
Um, and that's not the case. And you can even see it with ancient Judaism uh, and in the Old Testament of the Bible, it's valid for a woman to ask for a divorce if a man doesn't sexually please her. Uh, so this is, these types of like repressive views of sexuality in the body are something that really developed uh, late, uh, especially in the 19th century uh, in Islam, and is not something that is traditional in Islam. So she wanted to kind of show that this isn't the way it always was. Uh, so this one, the Encyclopedia of Pleasure, refers to a late 10th century Islamic text on sexual practices, on the advantages of coition and its values. Uh, and in the Hadith, um, which are kind of like writings that are around Islam, not part of the Quran, uh, there's a lot of talk about how um, men and women are supposed to please each other. Uh, and sexuality is a gift from God and it's sacred. Uh, so sex is a sacred duty. Uh, so this idea of being repressive towards your body uh, is something that would be alien to those types of ideas. Uh, so she talks about this here, and a lot of these writings, they're very explicit. Uh, they explain to men and women on how they can best please each other and get closer to each other. Um, so this last one is super abstract, and I'll just leave it to you to be able to figure out what's going on. Uh, I'll include a link to this video, and you can see her talking about her work and see some of the other work that she was doing and kind of think about how it functions um, not just for her or in Paris, which she's sometimes talking about, but also how it could be related to um, the world in the United States, if you're living in the United States. Uh, and she does talk about some of that a little bit. So last artist uh, we're going to talk about is Ibrahim Al Salahi. Uh, he's one of the artists from Khartoum. Uh, the Khartoum School is in Sudan, it's established about 1947. Uh, and like Gazbi Asuri, uh, he learned a lot of modernist art, but also took traditions that made more sense uh, for, from uh, his um, home culture uh, and integrate them into some modernist ideas. Um, so he's definitely part of the Pan-Arabist project and definitely part of um, African nationalism uh, and decolonization. So El Salahi, he studied and taught there uh, and he has lived in both the US and Nigeria uh, Currently, he's in Nigeria, I think. So some of his works, they take um, things from modernism, and they also take things from Islamic art uh, and from this developing style that's called Pan-Africanism. Uh, now Salah, he is definitely one of the influencers to lead towards some of these styles. So Pan-Africanism is um, can refer to culture, but it can also refer to politics. So over time with colonization uh, and with neo-colonization, um, Africans began to see themselves in a similar situation and to identify as Africans in a way that is anti-imperialist. In other words, we're all in this same position. We have to kind of work together to make that happen. Uh, and that also extends to um, art. Uh, so taking things that are very modern that make sense within the traditions that existed before. Uh, so that's what we're seeing with this self-portrait. Uh, there is imagery, so it's different than what you can see in Islamic art, but it's also very calligraphic, so it matches Islamic art. El Salah is also fond of um, having these kind of like earth-colored backgrounds, the earth of the Sudan, uh, and we'll talk about that in a couple of videos I'll put up um, in the description of this video. Um, so very calligraphic strokes. So this one... Um, is uh, one of his works where he's trying to work with a new medium and it didn't work so well in the video, he'll kind of explain. Uh, but he starts to develop these figures he had had before that were calligraphic, uh, and starts to add color. Uh, and they have these kind of like ghostly effects to them, uh, but also mechanistic. Uh, so in this one, it refers to his father, a funeral and a crescent. The crescent up here is one of the symbols of Islam. Uh, it's on some Islamic flags, uh, along with the color green. Um, and this particular painting refers to a memorial for his father, who was an Islamic cleric. And sometimes when prominent people in some Arab countries die, uh, also in non-Arab countries like Iran, um, there will be uh, a great celebration when they die, and they'll hold the coffin above. And sometimes, because of all the people trying to get close, uh, the body will fall out, and they'll pick up the body and keep moving. Uh, and that's kind of what's happening here. 
Uh, so the colors are muted, pur purposely echoing uh, the types of um, environment that you would see in Sudan. When you get in close, again, you can see this like kind of like modernism, almost getting towards like futurism with this mechanistic way of looking at the body, but also very calligraphic. We still are building on lines. So on this one, um, I'll give you a little bit of background so you can get an idea of what you might be talking about. This one's called The Inevitable. And uh, in one of the videos I'll post for you, he'll also explain this further. Uh, so in 1983, Sharia law was declared. Uh, and again, this is part of uh, US imperialism did extend to Sudan. Uh, still today, uh, the country of South Sudan is basically wholly unsupported, uh, exists because of the United States. Um, and you see those reactionary elements like you do in other places. So in 1983, Sharia law was declared, uh, and that's Islamic law, and um, that's um, enforced in many different ways. Uh, traditionally in Islamic countries, it only applied to people who are Islamic and not others. Uh, but when you know um, things started to break down uh, and reactionary elements rose up, uh, they tried to extend it to everybody. So along with that, um, this institution of Sharia law is kind of seen almost as a way to make allies for religious people because other things are going wrong. So there was a student strike in 1983 and then a law professional strike in 1983 as well. You know that if well-played lawyers are going on a strike, that things are pretty bad. And then there was a general strike in 1985 uh, to protest the rising costs of essentials. Uh, so governments that can't provide for their people uh, you know, will generally um, face the consequences. Makes me think of something that's going on in 2020 right now. Um, so in the video, he'll kind of talk about this in more detail, uh, but he started to develop this style when he was imprisoned. Um, he used to be a prominent figure and then briefly the government um, saw him as dangerous and they put him into this place called Cooper Jail uh, where they put political prisoners. And it's like, pretty horrible jail. Uh, it has this like, kind of dirt floor and they just throw you in there and don't give you a lot of food. Uh, and he eventually was able to get out uh, and he got, he'll talk about this in the video, he got an offer from the government uh, to be, after, after all this settled down, uh, to be a minister. And he said, yeah, I'll do that. And then he just left because he didn't, he didn't trust what was going on. Uh, but he developed a style while he was in prison um, because you know, his cell would be inspected where he would take um, little pieces of paper or um, little bits of pottery that he could find and he would start a drawing. Uh, and to him, and we'll talk about this in the video in detail, he would start out with a nucleus and let it grow out. Uh, so this is a very like kind of um, different way than what you see with a lot of Western artwork where you start with a plan and you plan everything out beforehand and deliberate and then try to reproduce that. Instead, because of the style where he developed, he would use one piece and then we would run out of room, he would extend it to another piece. Um, this growing type of art, uh, and he talks about it in a very Zen type of way, uh, is against that idea of deliberating. It's more of like a growth um, and it's unpredictable in a way. But you can see how with the inevitable, which is like a great name, he has some symbols that we've seen before, like the crescent right here, but also some other symbols like the raised fist that we'll see multiple times throughout this class. Uh, and then, you know, people wearing hoodies. So young people in protests, things that you can recognize that are kind of happening in the world right now. Uh, but you can also see this like kind of cell or seed type idea going on with this one, especially in this area. Uh, so one thing that you could do with this picture is try to kind of identify where did he start? Where does the picture grow from? Uh, it's not, you know, there's not a right answer, but it's a way that you can kind of understand his work and see how it develops. Um, so getting closer on this kind of like egg or embryo type of form that we have here. So he liked to work with different mediums uh, and the tree is just one of them. So he liked to work with textiles over time. Uh, again, part of this kind of pan arabist project. So I'll post a couple of videos in the description for this video explaining all the contemporary artists except for um, Hassan Fathi and Gazbi Asuri, but I'll have videos for all of them. Check out the videos along with this um, and try to kind of understand what the artists are talking about. I pick videos where the artists talk about themselves, uh, which I think is most useful 
way to learn about the art. 